Good morning to our Pacific Time Zone member. Good afternoon to our Eastern Seaboard member, and good evening to all our international friends that are joining us from Europe and Asia and all over the world. Welcome to the Consulting Mindset webinar hosted by Sayyid Asim Rashid, where he will be sharing how consultants can successfully navigate through challenges and build a better tomorrow for ourselves. In today's session, it's been sponsored by Skill Ranch, an organization that is providing training and coaching and seminars to empower individuals and organizations. Skill Ranch also hosts a podcast that gives knowledge on hard skills and soft skills for entrepreneurs, professionals, and consultants to impact tomorrow's work environment. You can find us at anchor.fm, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And if you wish to be a guest on my podcast, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And today's session is being co-hosted by Trevor Poplar, who is the Managing Director of 50,000 Foot Company. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you, Bilal, and I appreciate you passing it over to me. Uh, I'm very pleased to help bring everyone on this session together today as 50,000 Foot is focused on, the, on supporting independent consultants and small consulting firms through their journey. Following today's discussion, I will provide a little bit more information about 50,000 Foot, but what I would like to highlight today is that uh, today is the first day um, and the launch of 50,000 Foot's first ever National Consultant Day. Uh, we wanna recognize the contribution consultants make to businesses worldwide, and what better way to celebrate and have our guest speaker provide um, us a little bit more detail on the consulting mindset. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Creative Swan. Creative Swan is run by Saeed Asim Rashid, and it's a management consulting firm providing consulting, advisory, coaching, and workshop solutions to a wide array of industries and areas for over 24 years. Asim, our guest speaker and the president and CEO of Creative Swan, is an internationally recognized leader and consultant who is graciously given us some time today. So without further delay, I want to pass things over to Asim and look forward to hearing his session and what we need to understand about the proper consulting mindset. Asim, let me pass it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor and Bilal. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Ming Ming. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to come and speak with all of you on this occasion. It's fantastic. Um, and the topic is very interesting, the mindset of a consultant or the consulting mindset. Um, before we take a start formally on this discussion, uh, I would like to run a poll. So Trevor, can we have uh, the poll running first? Okay, so on your screen, you have a question, which is gaining and retraining people's trust is the top challenge caused by changing client behavior. Yes or no? Oh, fantastic. The result shows 88%. And this talks a lot about the type of world where we live, because when this survey was conducted a few years ago, the result in terms of yes was 42%, right? And this really tells us that we live in a VUCA world, which is fast changing, complex, and really volatile. Within two to three years, we see that the survey results are totally different and it's jumping from 42% to 88%. Thank you very much, uh, Travel. So fantastic to hear that. So in today's discussion, what I would like to do is, consultants are famous for um, telling stories. So I would like to uh, talk about a couple of cases, a couple of stories, and then we will try to understand what's a successful consultant's mindset should be, or how it should be working in terms of uh, executing projects for the clients. So the first uh, story that I would like to tell you is about one of my clients that belongs to construction industry. And in terms of construction industry, this client is very diversified. So they have uh, EPC division, they have infrastructure division, they do uh, engineering and construction projects, they are into O&M operation and maintenance, they are into manufacturing, service operations and all that. So the client of mine actually hired me to conduct um, a job for them, which was about developing competency framework. And uh, this competency framework was very interesting to develop because they wanted to develop uh, one competency framework across the five divisions. 
And the five divisions, uh, as for the discussion, actually did not agree that all of them can have a similar or identical set of competency framework. Now this competency framework was pretty important because based on that, they were supposed to develop their people in terms of execution of projects, in terms of developing future leaders. But at the same time, it was pretty hard to seek consensus. And that's where you know the value of an external consultant comes into action or comes into play. So when I was supposed to deal with that situation, you know, I had to talk to a lot of people in different divisions, and then we decided to conduct some sort of a design thinking workshops where we had a lot of people coming from all divisions, including leaders, and then we talked about how to address the challenges. So some of the interesting thing that were in the room was that, you know, when different division uh, pop up into the room, they were of course sitting according to their divisions, um, and at the same time, they were also of the opinion that uh, the, th the things are not going to be identical for different divisions. So you cannot have one solution for uh, all the divisions. So the way I started was that I uh, did a lot of research, not only about the client, but I also went into the international clients uh, of different parts of the world who are actually operating in similar kind of business. And based on their best practices, I pulled together an initial orientation style uh, presentation which was very brief and to the point because we had many senior people around so you cannot just go and talk about theoretical or academic stuff so we had some fantastic orientation in the beginning and i shared some of the best practices that are being adopted by businesses across the world who are into similar kind of businesses and once i did that then we had the conversation um, one of the things that i found in the room was that different divisions you know they were not willing to except that there could be similarities between them. So I conducted a couple of design thinking exercises and tried to um, you know, you know, help them understand that there are similarities more than the differences. And we had a couple of sessions of that. And uh, after you know, some effort, we came to the point where we actually started to make some progress. And uh, yes, uh, there were still some you know, barriers to change. There were some people who could not buy into the solution, and some of the people even challenged the solution. In fact, uh, some people also came up with the idea that this whole exercise, uh, how we are doing that. So for example, you're a consultant, you have a methodology, and then there's a client to start challenging your methodology as well. So, you know, it was supposed to be managed through skills like influencing, uh, creating internal partnerships in the room, creating partnership with the leadership, and making sure that we cross through the barriers and move to the, to the next part of the equation. And uh, once you know some of those elements were handled, uh, even the team was able to see that the kind of uh, dissimilarities that they were thinking exist between them were actually not as much as they thought initially. So there were more similarities. And finally, you know, at the end of the day, we came up with a solution. We were, we were, we were able to create competency framework which was pretty much consistent. And yes, there were some things which were specific to the divisions and then uh, we worked with the divisions so that divisions can have some of those areas highlighted ex as exceptions or exclusions so that everybody could agree to it and, and move on. So that was a fantastic experience where five or six different divisions were totally different. At the end of the day, they came up with the solution themselves and they themselves said that, you know what, we, we probably have more similarities than dissimilarities. And yes, there are areas where we are supposed to work uh, in a different manner or in a different fashion. This is an example from a construction industry project. Now, the second story that I would like to discuss with you comes from um, energy industry. So um, one of uh, the companies, energy companies, oil and gas company, in fact, upstream, uh, was going through the phase of uh, an acquisition. And uh, they were towards the end of the year where they had some budgets remaining uh, to be consumed. And uh, somehow I was contacted and uh, when I asked them what you are looking for, they said, look, before the acquisition, we have certain budgets which are available and we would like to make a great use of this budget. So you suggest, uh, what do you think we should be doing? So uh, what I told them is that, look, you guys are going to be acquired by a company, which is another oil company. And once you're acquired by them, you both come from different uh, backgrounds, different cultures in terms of uh, business, in terms of company. So uh, you're going to experience a lot of anxiety, lots of challenges because you have different business cultures, you will be acquired. 
you know, your status is going to change, your organization will merge, it will restructure, there could be job losses, there could be, you know, people could move upward in the organization. So why don't we do something related to that? And uh, they were actually very keen to do something interesting. So I suggested that why don't we do a program where we actually make your people understand how business cultures uh, in different parts uh, of the world or in different type of companies uh, merge or uh, coincide or collide. So I created a very specific bespoke kind of a workshop and intervention for them where we work together with those clients and we also try to understand how the different uh, energy companies uh, operate in terms of their business culture, in terms of their methodology, in terms of their uh, growth and expansion plans and all that. And uh, in that particular exercise, uh, I kind of uh, try to create a lot of understanding and awareness in terms of uh, what's probably going to happen tomorrow. Um, now, I did that. A lot of people appreciated and enjoyed. But the most interesting thing happened roughly a year later when actually the two companies who were merged together, I was invited again by the company that actually acquired that company to conduct a, a change leadership program. And interestingly, there were people sitting in that room uh, who were actually part of that exercise a year earlier. And then we had a very interesting experience where a lot of people were on board on many, many things. And uh, we were able to uh, conduct a very comprehensive workout and design thinking workshop in terms of how to move forward after this change process. So interestingly, uh, something that you do for a client in this fast paced world, tomorrow that client can be acquired by another client. And when you go and work for them, that could be your advantage. So when I was actually working for this company that acquired the, the, the other company, um, I was kind of a preferred choice because I had a very good background. I knew the boats, I knew both the businesses, I knew their challenges, I even understood in terms of how they were feeling about that acquisition uh, when this, that acquisition was actually happening. So if you deliver to a client uh, a bespoke solution, the need of the hour kind of a solution, then from there tomorrow it's going to help you. You have actually uh, no idea about that. So these were the two stories um, that I wanted to begin with. And um, right uh, at this point, uh, if we could uh, you know, take a quick break and maybe run a second poll, Trevor. So here's a uh, question number two. Management consulting firms can boost their profitability by reducing expenses. Easy question, yes, no. Oh, great, so we are seeing a 55% yes and a 48% no. Now, this is pretty uh, interesting uh, because uh, two or three years ago when this uh, similar kind of a survey was conducted, pre-COVID pre situation. So there were like 74% yes. But today the, the number has been reduced to 55%. Again, a reflection of the changing world, the, the, the VUCA world as we always talk about. Great, thank you, Trevor. So Trevor, can we uh, take a few questions over here at this point? Absolutely. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please um, take your uh, microphone off mute, ask the question, and we'll take a few moments uh, to see if anybody has uh, anything that they're interested in asking a scene. Okay, so what was the question? I saw it on the screen that I'm a new person, new consultant maybe. And yep, the so the question is, uh, I am from Pakistan and new in the field. What advice would you give to beginners? Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I would say that there is a piece of advice that will come towards the end of the session. So if you could hold on to that question. Uh, you will get like plenty of advice towards the end, a summary of advice essentially. Okay, Sam, let's, uh, let's uh, return back to the presentation and uh, we'll readdress uh, at the Q&A. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, every time I say that, I apologize. <laughs> uh, a a yeah. question does come in. Okay, yeah, so we have it. another question. <laughs> no apology needed, Lisa. Um, my yeah. fault, I, I overspoke too soon. <clears throat> yeah. The question is, how do you manage pushing a new program in an organization when there are already mature established programs and a lot of pushback? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, this is kind of a perfect question that uh, we ask when we run change management program or the change leadership program. So uh, there is a classic way to do that. And uh, 
I would say that the first and the foremost thing that you know I've experienced in this whole process uh, is that you know you create a sense of urgency. I think that's the most important thing. When you begin a change management program, um, you have to have a leadership buy-in because unless you do not have a leadership buy-in, it is really hard and I would say next to impossible to drive uh, change management programs. Um, once you have the leadership buy-in and you create a sense of urgency in the organization and uh, you create change agents within the organization because not everybody is going to support your change management program for one reason or the other, um, then you can start driving the change. So you can conduct various interventions. You can conduct a change management program where you can actually let people rent out what they feel is right or wrong about the change. And then you can uh, come up with the stakeholder buy-in and you can move from there. But the challenge is this is going to continue and you have to have those change agents spread across the organization who believe in that agenda from their heart that this is the best thing for the company and they should be influencing in their departments and divisions. Now, from my experience, one of the mistakes that people make in this process is that sometimes they feel that if there are people who are senior in the organization or they might have spent more time over there, they, if they push back on something, they start uh, considering them like internal enemies. And that's a huge mistake because some of these people uh, who may not be at a leadership position, uh, they do carry out uh, a lot of influence and respect across the organization. So they are sort of unofficial leaders. People listen to them. So it is very important to convince some of those guys and try to address their challenges and, and solve them. And let me tell you something uh, very interesting. I was in a, in a digital summit uh, this afternoon and I just uh, was sharing a, a point uh, with them about a PWC study, which says that 75% of change initiatives will fail, all due to the lack of a digital culture. So for example, if you are trying to bring change in terms of digital transformation, then 75% initiatives will fail because of the culture. So sometimes people try to bring change without considering the culture of the organization. So that is also very, very important. So it's, it's a combination of several steps. Uh, take it uh, one by one and then go through the process. And uh, communication is the key. Yeah, there is, I mean, no limit to communication that you do during the change management process. Does this address your question? I think that was a great SM. We, we do have one more question from Usman that came in. Um, this will be the last question we'll take at this period and then we'll move on. Lisa does say yes, thank you very much. And Usman's question is, I am working in hydropower consulting field and I've noticed that the consulting future is no anyone, sorry, let me read this again. I'm working in the hydropower consulting field. I have noticed that the consulting future is no anymore because of EPC contracts. What is your opinion on that? Please elaborate. Yeah, so look, there are various types of consulting services that we provide, all of us provide. So there are there is technical consulting, then there is process consulting, right? So technical consulting is something in which you are technically expert and you go and you provide the technical service. Um, and yes, as you just said that, you know, as long as bigger players enter into the technical domain, uh, the technical consulting of uh, individuals or smaller firms could be challenged because, you know, those EP EPC firms are like mammoths. They are giants. However, if you think about process consulting, uh, th that's a great area to explore, I would say, because in process consulting, you are not an expert on the technicality of any industry but you know the process of problem solving. So you go there, you talk to people, you work with them, you work through them, you work within them, and then you evolve the solutions from them, right? So that's the way to go about it. So my, my view is that um, in any industry, if you see that the future is bleak one way or the other, the question for you is um, disruption is coming. Either you disrupt or you will be disrupted, right? So the key question is that if something is coming up and someone can see that, 
than what he or she is doing about it. I, I think that's the key question one should ask himself or herself. Uh, that would be my answer to this. You're welcome, Usman. Good. So Trevor, if there are no more questions, can we move on or? Um, yes, there, there's another question, but I'm gonna hold it to the end uh, and we'll, we'll address it in the question and answer period. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so I'll take you, I talked about the construction industry, then I talked about uh, energy industry, and I'll take you to a business school, right? Uh, that's a very interesting assignment that I have. And as I promised in the beginning, I'll just talk from my experience, I'll tell you my story. Some people say consultants uh, just get paid for telling stories, right? But these are genuine, real stories where actually I was able to solve some problems for the, for the clients. So, this client uh, is basically a very uh, prestigious business school and um, they had developed a strategy framework and uh, they just want to make sure that there's a good discussion and progress on that strategy framework. Now, some of you who have worked with uh, business schools and universities and you know, educational institutions, you understand that they have a very different way of operation just like you know, we compare corporate sector, private sector versus public sector, the government offices. So there is a very big difference in terms of how the business schools or the universities operate. So my task as a consultant was to work with a team of 30 plus brightest minds. Uh, majority of them were department heads and PhDs and extremely qualified people in different domains, right from you know, social sciences towards economics and from uh, business to mathematics and IT to, you know, some of the executive education areas and financing and accounting, HR, marketing, very diversified uh, experts, you know, the very learned people. So my job was to bring consensus on some of the areas. And that was a tough job because as you can understand that um, academics, they do not argue like, uh, like the corporate sector people, right? They, uh, they argue based on hypothesis. Uh, they have a very educated way of uh, conducting debates. Um, all those things that we study in the research when we do our MBAs or you know, se senior level projects and all that. So I had to prepare for that. I mean, it was a tough project. So I uh, met with a lot of people, tried to understand the challenges, the, the future perspectives, uh, the organizational health. I also spoke with the key customer, which was the, the students, you know, of different uh, areas, and try to gather as much information as I could possibly can. So once I had all that information, we were rented to that, you know, retreat workout, and uh, we conducted the sessions. But look, we are talking about academics, right? So if you go there and uh, as a plain corporate person or consultant, uh, it's not going to work out like that. You have to go and, and show to the people that you have come with great homework and you're speaking somewhat a similar kind of a language. You earn their respect and trust and only then the conversation, the real conversation will, will, will probably begin. So one of the things that I did was um, I actually looked at the trends in the education sector, especially business education and you know, higher level education. I looked at the trends globally, what is happening, the experimentations that universities are making, like for example, some of the US universities are trying to create a design studio where they put an MBA with an engineer and a doctor and they work together on a project to create something very interesting. Now that's a very interesting thing. And other experiments, you know, some of the places are doing where they are actually bringing people from the different parts of the world who are working in different universities and they do virtual online projects and with their different countries, background, knowledge, cultures, they're able to create something totally different, totally unique. So I, the first thing that I tried to do was I just tried to share the future trends, what's going to happen in the, in the future of education. The, the university of the future. So just to elaborate you know, a little more on that, so I spoke about um, uh, Professor Clayton Christensen, who was very famous for his theory on digital um, uh, innovative disruption, sorry, innovation, innovative disruption. And uh, Professor Clay, Clayton Christensen, who is you know, uh, called Clay, uh, spoke a lot about uh, disruption happening in the university. And he wrote a book uh, and some articles in which he argued that brick and mortar campuses will vanish in the future. 
So I brought some of that stuff, you know, his, his books, references and all that. And, uh, you know, like in the first few hours, I was able to break the ice and the conversation began. And when the conversation began, one of the important things for me was to make sure that, you know, the conversation uh, happens in a way that I'm just a facilitator. So I'm not a subject matter expert. I was, as I was just giving an example that in process consulting, you're not an SME uh, necessarily, but you own the process. So you create the structure. And, uh, you know, in the, in the first few hours, uh, we were able to generate very interesting debates. And then I had to sort of uh, split the teams in a way that people could uh, work together in working groups and they were sort of uh, there were arguments there were debates and uh, there were some of the people who had their own opinion about things and I had to intervene at some and some points I had to actually uh, me mediate between two people at, at times I had to negotiate among people uh, at times I had to take uh, even uh, a hard stance you know so basically even in the hard stance situation you have to make sure that people understand that you're part of the team. You're trying to make, make progress overall. And that's the way it goes. So uh, it was a very, very tough assignment. And um, as I just mentioned, that there was tremendous uh, PhD population in the room. And uh, at the end of the day, we, we came out very successful. And um, uh, one of the academics, you know, during the lunch break or tea break, when I sat with them, uh, I just laughed with them. We had fun. And one of the academics told me that, you know, uh, no, actually, I asked him a question. There, there's a terminology called peer review in which they review each other's articles. So I just joked with them, oh, you guys have done my peer review and my past. So they laughed and they said, you know, even before you entered the room in the morning, your peer review was done, right? So we were just watching you for the first few hours, how it goes, what do you do, what do you say? And we appreciated that you came up with a lot of great homework. So homework is very important that earns you the respect. And once you have the respect, people are able to kind of listen to you. So this was just another story in which, you know, some of the preparations on a high uh, horsepower of, you know, mindsets and minds was, able, was there in the room. And we were able to come up with a very good, you know, growth plan, strategy execution plan, uh, an action plan where people could actually, actually go back and own the plan because it was generated by themselves as part of the change process could go back and execute. So it was a great, great project that you know, I, I felt very proud of. So these were the three uh, important, um, uh, some of the important stories that I wanted to share from three, three different industries. And uh, before we actually go towards the Q&A, what I wanted to do is, you, I want you to, uh, to go back or go away with like a couple of takeaways from all these three stories as a summary. So we all know about the seven wonders of the world, right? So what I want is that you think of the seven wonders of consulting, right? And uh, here are the seven wonders of consulting in, in my view. So wonder number one, fact, 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 preparation, research. You know, it's going to earn a lot of respect from the client for you. And once you're able to earn the respect, you can really uh, move things around. You can make progress, right? So fact, fact, fact. Number two, the second wonder of consulting. Get involved in the problem solving process inclusively. So it's not that you provide a structure of problem solving to people and you just let them solve the problem. Well, you have to get involved with them. And that means sometimes uh, coming in the middle of a heated argument between two people and sort of mediating the situation, doing the conflict management, and, and making progress, driving it forward. So solve the problem, but in an inclusive manner. Number three, listen, be empathetic, right? One of the challenges with consultants is they do so many projects, busy consultants do work in, in different industries all the time. So they always have ready-made solutions like the back of their hand, they know the solution. But the problem is that this uh, takes you into a situation where you look at the problem and you have a solution. It's the same thing that, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail to you. So please uh, listen to the client, understand, show empathy, and don't force your solutions from previous experiences on your client. Try to understand, listen, and, and try to come up with a bespoke solution. 
the fourth wonder of consulting jointly build solutions right so yeah you can get into the problem solving process workouts and all that but jointly build the solutions right show your value and create a structure orientation create an environment uh, a conducive environment where people actually solve the problems using practical tools and frameworks and there are so many tools and frameworks that if you know if we start talking about them we can speak uh, almost an hour about them so there is lean there is six sigma there is vsm value stream mapping uh, there is dmac right uh, there is brainstorming it's brain writing fishbone diagram there is failure mode and effect analysis uh, on the creativity side there, there are mind maps there are six hacks there's design thinking there are g style workouts uh, the famous old fashioned and uh, you know evergreen swot analysis the 7s quarter five courses growth share matrix uh, and you know, the list goes on so there these are tremendous tools but you learn as a consultant how to go and apply them rather than talking about these tools from a theoretical standpoint the fifth wonder of consulting get everyone on board if there are client representatives in a meeting in a session who seem to be disengaged for some reason it's your job to engage them and use your positive influence right because there is a reason why your client has hired you if they can really solve all the internal problems probably they don't need to hire you you want a third person who can earn their respect and as a third person you can be a person who is a go to person for every single guy who is involved in the process so getting everyone on board is so important and using your powerful positive influencing skills is the key uh, to the to the victory the sixth wonder of consulting in my view is negotiate so whenever you know you see that there are two client departments or divisions or, or individuals in a meeting in a setting who are kind of you know having opposing views to each other this is going to hamper the progress of your project it can also jeopardize your project right your payments can delay as a consultant your name can be spoiled as a consultant so make sure that you negotiate you manage conflicts uh, and you are ready to take a hard stance if necessary to make progress right so at some point in time where you just feel that as a consultant a lot of people are challenging you which will definitely happen because to be honest with you when you go to a client's location or facility as a consultant a lot of people think that you are some consultant and actually they think that you do not have any working experience and uh, that's where it is very important that you earn the respect by number 1 which was fact 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 preparation research and once you have the client respect a lot of people would be willing to listen to you even if you give them like a, a, a tough talk or, or a hard talk to, to, to people. Now, the seventh uh, and the final wonder of uh, consulting from my side, and you may have your own wonders as well, is, you know, learn how to present, learn how to communicate, communicate through, you know, presentations, through, through data, through email, uh, through events and all that. Uh, you measure the results of whatever you are doing because what gets measured gets done what gets measured gets better and once you propose the solutions you follow up you adjust you reapply you tweak and you make sure that the things keep moving right so it's not just about um, having a very good knowledge your presentation ability and a skill is very important several years ago um, i was in a meeting with a very large consulting firm and uh, you know the, we had a very good discussion myself and the senior consulting manager over there and the guy you know when I, before i left he uh, just stopped me and said hey you know what um, we, we won't be able to give you an assistant so i smiled and i said look you know what i don't need an assistant because i just do my stuff myself so this is another important thing that if you have too many assignments or too many projects it's very important that you focus on communication because you know many uh, clients you know they actually look forward towards you in terms of how you present data and how you present facts sometimes you may have great consulting assignment results but you are unable to present uh, the data to them and another important thing is that you know as a as a technical person at times you may have a tendency to go too deep into the technical affairs while uh, the people who are sitting in the room belong to the senior leadership so they uh, speak a different language and they would like to hear a different language so if you are trying to talk to them in terms of uh, items or areas which are too close to the field uh, they may not be interested in that they would like to know what's the bottom line impact on the profit margin 
how your actions and steps will translate into uh, additional sales, um, improvement in quality, reduction in cycle time, uh, improved delivery for the customer, a better net promoter score for the, from the client, uh, a better feedback from the client, or uh, improving the overall product productivity or efficiency in their, in their plant or the factory or the core operations. So speak the right language. So communication is, is a very, very important factor. And finally, you know, as I always like to say, that people talk about disruption all the time. Look, disruption is not coming. People say AI is coming, artificial intelligence is coming. Disruption is not coming, AI is not coming. It's already here. 67% of the people actually do not know that they are using AI. They are using artificial intelligence, they do not know that. 67% according to a survey. And you understand these surveys change every minute, every second these days. So the data is increasing, the data is changing, the data is fast evolving. So my uh, you know, final message is that disruption is here, uh, disrupt or be disruptive. And thank you very much everyone for your time and attention. Thank you, Amir. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories, your insights. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your seven wonders of consulting. Uh, it's definitely given me uh, a lot to think about and to take away uh, from this session. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your insight and, and sticking around and answering some questions. We've got a, a few questions that have appeared uh, in the uh, chat box that we'll cover momentarily. Um, and uh, your continued insight uh, will be much appreciated. Uh, before uh, everybody, we move on uh, to that uh, component, the Q&A session, I just want to take two more minutes of your time just to highlight uh, 50,000 foot and what we uh, are trying to accomplish. Uh, as a platform. Uh, we at 58,000 Foot are providing solutions to help strengthen uh, consultants, independent consultants and small consulting firms um, and help them to find new heights within their business. We do that in five ways. Uh, those five ways are listed on the screen. We want to help consultants build stronger client base. So grow your network and, and share opportunities amongst each other uh, so that we can continue to strengthen this community uh, that's growing each and every day globally. Uh, we want to continue to expand engagements for our population. Uh, so find new and exciting opportunities uh, across the board um, from teaming up and going after larger uh, opportunities that may not be in reach individually uh, to micro engagements uh, to a number of different learning opportunities that can help you challenge yourself in your business. We help uh, consultants on our site grow their revenues we do that in a number of different ways. We have additional revenue partner programs coming that allow you to expand your discussion with your clients. Uh, and we have ways in which you can license and share your IP with the community. We want to maximize your non-billable time. Uh, so meaning we're bringing partners uh, to our clients uh, that can help you find the solutions you need to lower your risk and spend more time working on billable projects. Uh, but finally, the goal is to help you create your brand recognition uh, and bring your market to the business in, in a more sustainable and long-term way. So please, uh, if you have a moment, go to 50,000foot.com, uh, learn a little bit more about what we're doing as a community, um, as uh, it's very important that we continue, just as Asim has uh, talked about, uh, to grow uh, our skill set and make independent consulting and small consulting firms more powerful globally. I'm going to open it to Bilal now, um, and Bilal will open the question and period session, and I'll go through uh, some of the questions that show up uh, on the chat forum. So Bilal, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Trevor and Asim, for a wonderful session on the consulting mindset. Uh, and we can start with the question that we have in chat, and then we can move towards live Q&A. So Usman Gani asked, Asim, that I have noticed in construction industry, especially in hydropower, the people think the role of consulting is just make the stories and make hindrances in execution work. I think in hydropower field, client just hired the consultant due to FIDIC contracts. What are your thoughts on it, Asim? Okay, Bilal, so uh, I couldn't hear exactly. 
because I think the, the, the voice was breaking a little bit. So I, I would try to construct an answer based on what I understood. So one of the things that you have to understand is that hydropower projects are high dollar value projects, right? And they are the type of projects in which you have to have funding from very large financial institutions, uh, people like World Bank or Asian Development Bank and all that. Now, when you have to have uh, such financial institutions involved in the process, you have to understand that they have their own process, their own checklists to come and assess you as an organization. And many times you have to take a partner on board who also takes stake in the project or equity in the project. Uh, even the EPC partners sometimes should be large enough to come up uh, with some of those things. Now, what happened is that when you hire consultants in projects like that, uh, they have to take blessings from many stakeholders, including those financial institutions, right? So those financial institutions sometimes uh, are kind of, you know, uh, geared towards those consultants who have already worked with them in the past, who understand their process, procedures, documentation requirements, and they have a tendency to kind of uh, route you towards those consultants. Because, you know, everyone's job becomes much easier. They can connect the, with the client better and also explain to the client what's needed by some of those financial institutions. So yes, I mean, for hydro projects, which are high dollar value projects, the game is totally different. And I, as I just mentioned that in this type of projects, the type of consultants that you need are totally different. They are very different from process consultants, from management consultants. They are generally uh, a pretty sort of uh, well-groomed in terms of handling the techno-financial aspect of the project. So that's why, you know, hydro is again a very specialized area. We have to understand that. Uh, not everyone can just walk into a hydropower project and start uh, doing things from a technical standpoint as well as commercial standpoint. So yes, I mean, it takes time to develop expertise as a consultant in those projects. And if you get a chance to work with some of the larger financial institutions in one of those projects, it's going to be great learning. And then that will open the way for you across the world. So for example, if you work on an ADB project, Asian Development Bank project, they would love to have you back on their project within the region because you understand the requirement and all that in terms of documentation. So yeah, it takes time, but you know, once, uh, once you do enough hard work, it's very rewarding as well. And not, it's, it's in terms of Fortress Five Forces, the barrier to entry is high. That's what I would say. Not everyone would like to enter here, but once you enter and learn, I mean, it's your field. Not everyone can enter over here. Asim, we have another question from Mohammed. Uh, the question is, I hold a global role and work with an oil major, part of a very diverse team. There are senior colleagues in the team. Those are close to uh, retirement almost. And there are always been a push to drive any change program in the department. It's a big struggle actually, how to tackle such situations in a team when the people are not willing to own the change. What would be your thoughts around that question? Yeah, my thoughts around those, this question is that um, oil industry is not now, for the last few years, it is going through a pro process which is termed as the great crew shift. The great crew shift. So a lot of people in oil industry, there was a trend that people would retire and then they would continue to work as consultants, even in their late seventies and all that, because you have to understand that those people who spend time in oil industry in the early part, they actually developed so much of experience that they became like, uh, uh, I, I would say like gems. And a lot of those people had very wide degrees. So imagine somebody who was a mechanical engineer from 30, 40, 50 years ago, who is mechanical as well as electrical. Now, today you have petroleum, right? You have mechanical, you have automotive, you have manufacturing, you have industrial, but that person was very diversified and then that person had a lot of diversified experience. So that great cruise shift is happening because that generation, uh, basically the baby boomer generation, is actually uh, gradually getting out from the workplace. And uh, while they are moving out, uh, Gen X or millennials are coming up uh, uh, to fill up the space uh, of course, there is a gap in the way of thinking between these generations. So the challenge is there. But I would say 
The important thing is that as millennials and Gen X get into the leadership roles, they work together and try to define the future. Uh, because a lot of boomers are almost on the verge of retirement or they're working on, on contracts. And look, this is, a, this is a general human tendency. Uh, let me give you an example. You know, that probably would answer your question. So I, I was talking, I was giving a speech in an educational institution. And I talked about, uh, it was somewhere else. I, I talked about the future of education. And um, I was talking about skills of the future. And at the end of the class, I asked the teachers, do we teach skills of the future or skills of the past? So almost all teachers said, yeah, we teach skills of the past by and large. So I said, so what will happen uh, 10 years from now? So the senior most teacher in the room laughed and said, oh, I'll be done and retired by that time, right? But then my question is, if I think like this, what's my legacy? Well, we are supposed to work on our legacy, right? As Jack Ma says that you work on your legacy. So the point is that yes, it is a challenge. It is very much understandable. But then, you know, seniors should think about their legacy and the people who are behind them should think about their future. And that's where I think the role of leadership comes into the play where they bring these generations together, let them sit together, hire a fine consultant. That's where the consultants are needed, right? And, and solve the solution in an amicable manner. Develop a change management program and drive it, drive it with passion. Tough task, I would say. Thanks, um, Asim. We've got another question here. It's a two-parter. Yeah. Please share your experience on the scope of using data analytics in the consulting industry. And then number two, where does the use of big data analytics stand in the Middle East and in Pakistan? Okay. So data analytics is, is very, very important. And uh, it, it is coming more and more into action. But let me tell you uh, one important thing that a lot of organizations can still fix a lot of their problem using basic data analytics techniques, right? A lot of people talk about big data, but they do not understand that uh, big data is really big data. So when you have data that you cannot handle with basic tools like Excel and the data points increase just too much and they become too many, that's where you bring big data into the equation. You don't have to bring big data into everything, uh, basic solutions and all that. So data analytics is a very important element. And I would say that not just in manufacturing, but also everywhere, you know, there are applications. Uh, there is a lot of understanding and some of these things are very critical in the uh, future of skills and future of jobs. Now, the second part is about big data applications and usage in the Middle East and in Pakistan. So I would say that uh, work is going on. Uh, there is a, a development, there is awareness. People are trying to understand, but uh, when you go and you see uh, a lot of work in the companies, uh, a lot of companies do not have that much data or, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, I'm not trying to say they're not generating data. So you may be generating a lot of data, but you may not be kind of storing and recording it in a way that you can use it for big data analytics. But I would say awareness is there. A lot of organizations are offering courses. A lot of young people are trying to learn. Um, but again, a lot of people need to do a lot of work on that. So it's somewhere in the, I would say, development phase at this point. Um, we have another question. Uh, the question is, how to trust consultant that he will be able to tackle the strategic issues that were outside from the one's experience and expertise like digital and AI? Um, if I understand the question correctly, you mean to say that you want uh, to hire a consultant for uh, stuff like digital and AI, and uh, it is beyond his or her capacity or capability. Well, then it's very hard because I tell you that you may hire a process consultant who is basically an expert on running a design thinking workshop, right? 
And uh, that design thinking workshop uh, is probably required to create a digital strategy for the company, right? Now, the challenge is probably I understand correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, that the consultant is not aware of the digital world, right? But the consultant may be an expert on running brainstorming session, or maybe an expert on brain writing or, you know, FMEA, et cetera. Now, one of the challenges that I personally feel is that even if you are a process consultant, you have to have some kind of basic knowledge so that when people are talking the terminology, you are able to understand, you're able to connect. So for example, if I do not understand AI uh, or ML, for example, right, or how blockchain operates and work, and I'm trying to facilitate a digital transformation session, then just beyond running the process, the brainstorming process or the design thinking process, uh, it will become harder and harder for me to add value. So I would say that anytime, as I just mentioned to you in the beginning, uh, first wonder was about research, fact, 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 uh, collect it, uh, understand, learn. That's the beauty of being a consultant, right? Every day is a new challenge. Every day you learn new things. So the key point is that you have to have some basic knowledge, some of the ideas. You must know what the other companies or other parts of the world are doing when it comes to digital transformation. Let, let me give you an example. So if a government hires you and tells you that you come up with an e-governance strategy for that government, then you may want to go and study Estonia, right? Uh, because Estonia is doing fantastic as a digital government. The problem is when you will start to study Estonia, uh, you will see suddenly a lot of digital transformation terminology will pop up. And if you do not understand that, then it will become harder for you to connect the dots. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a technical person for that, or you have to be kind of an engineer or a computer data scientist, but you should be able to understand and at least explain it in layman terminology. So please uh, differentiate between a, a technical consultant and a process consultant. So you may be a consultant who may be part of a digital transformation strategy because you're good in terms of knowledge on digital transformation. But when it comes to implementing SAP or, or, or Oracle, you may not be the consultant because that requires hardcore uh, technical skills. So that's the way you should be differentiating. Thanks, Asim. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I know we've uh, made it to the hour session length, but uh, we are still open. If you're still open to answering a few more questions uh, that you may have, uh, we will keep the, the field open uh, for a few more moments. Uh, please, uh, it's been working very well in the chat section. Uh, so if you have a question and you want it addressed, um, please enter it into the group chat and, uh, and I can share it with the community. Asim, Lisa says, thank you very much. And she enjoyed it uh, very much herself. And uh, so she appreciates your support and your session today. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we have another question here. If possible, can you give a little more explanation on design thinking you mentioned twice in your examples. Yeah, so um, I talked about many uh, tools that consultants can use. Uh, and one of the finest tool these days is design thinking. So in a design thinking process, you basically come up with a lot of ideas and then you select some of the ideas for experimentation and uh, execution. Uh, then you execute them then you develop a prototype product or process or experience or service. Then you measure the outcome, then you come back, fine tune it, and then you redo it. And now this is a way of life, I would say. So in organizations uh, who have pioneered this process, like uh, a very famous organization, which is a design organization called IDEO, which is I-D-E-O, uh, I for Ireland, D for Denmark, E for English, for Orange, IDEO. That's one of the pioneer companies. And if you go to their website, 
uh, you will find plenty of knowledge and information about this. So this is a very basic, simple structured process where you actually generate ideas, filter ideas, prioritize ideas, then you develop a prototype product or process or experience, then you run it, then you come back and you learn it. And it's an inclusive process just to make sure that uh, the whole organization is, is part of it. So a lot of tech industries these days definitely use this design thinking process. It's an inclusive process where you take everybody and ask for uh, suggestions and all that. So uh, not exactly, but you know, back when Toyota was developing Toyota production system and they had those quality circles and some of those things. So at a different level, at the factory floor level, they had also these ideas of bring, bringing solutions from those people who are closest to the job. Uh, but design thinking is at a different uh, you know, level, a different way to do that. So does that help? And you can do further research with the company IDEO. And you can also find maybe uh, some of the talks on YouTube about it and fine tune your knowledge on that. That's a very good tool for consultants and even organizations can do that. Managers can apply that themselves. We have another follow-up question from Mohammed. Importance of getting ample experiences noted before starting a consultancy. However, is there any ideal age bracket where one should enter into the consultancy field? Uh, that's a great question, you know, and I, I'll tell you the, the most practical answer that I've seen. So uh, let's talk about very large consulting firms, the big ones, you know, whose names are like ideal for those who really want to build careers into consulting business. How do they hire at what age bracket? So the typical people who get hired in those large consulting firms, this is their profile. So they do an undergraduate and after doing the undergraduate, they go and work in a very large firm because you know, they are among the top performers, two to three years. Then they go and take an MBA from a top business school, right? So again, undergraduate, then work in a top company, then after two to three years, go and take a top uh, university MBA. And after the MBA, you join the, one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest consulting firms as an associate. And by the time you are joining them, you are somewhere around 27, 28. You're in your late twenties, right? That's the age where you go and join some of those large organizations. And you know, this, there could be exceptions also. People come with experience and all that. With experience, it's a separate story, but look at this person who is very young. So how that person earns the respect of the client? They have to study a lot. They have to you know, go through the research reports. They just read, 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 and come back and you know, make presentations and make cases, uh, make analysis in front of their seniors. And then they go and present those things in front of you know, top company, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company CEOs. Those CEOs are not going to listen to those people who are in their late 20s with no experience if they do not come up with a lot of research. So that's why when I said in the beginning, fact, 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 research. So if you are backing up your answers with a lot of facts, data, numbers, other companies, benchmarking practices and all that, then the CEO will listen to you because that CEO may not be having the type of exposure that you may have as a consultant or working with several companies. So while there's no ideal age, I just told you that even in your late twenties, you can go and join a consulting firm, work hard, fact, 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 research, study, and uh, earn the respect from your client and you will do fantastic. A lot of those consultants are pretty young in their late twenties and they're very confident in terms of presenting the right things to very senior people. Great. Um, we have uh, another question. How can someone enter consulting field with an engineering background? Well, um, a lot of uh, consultants are engineers. And um, if you recall, uh, the, the, our former GE chairman, Jack Welch was a chemical engineer. He was a PhD. And everybody uh, uh, likes to quote him when it comes to management philosophies. So he was a pure PhD kind of an engineer and he was a great manager. He's, uh, his words are quoted even today. So uh, yes, you can be a consultant, but again, define what kind of consultants you want to be. If you want to be uh, an engineering consultant, that's a different story. 
if you want to be a management consultant or a process consultant, then it's a good idea that you go and work in a company for some time and develop your skills. And once you develop your skills uh, in terms of technicalities, then it's the right time to move out, look into the consulting area. Uh, because, you know, engineering consulting, you can always do once you learn the basics while working in the company and developing your experiences uh, about codes and design and all those things. But uh, when it comes to design consulting or management consulting, uh, design means the, the business design and all that, not the engineering design. Then basically you need some experience uh, that would help you. So yeah, you can enter with experience. And uh, maybe sometimes people say that on top of your engineering, if you take an MBA degree, it actually prepares you in some way uh, towards consulting. Because in MBA, you actually deal with a lot of industries. And that develops uh, lots of skills in terms of tools and frameworks and presentations. And that actually helps you uh, in terms of developing as a, as, a, as a consultant. So one way to do that would be this one. Great, we, we actually have another question. Hope you're comfortable in continuing on for a few more minutes. It oh, says, okay, great. It says, is it appreciated to quote other companies' data and analysis as an example to different companies' CEOs? Yeah, that's a great question. So the first thing that you have to see is, as a consultant, um, one of the things is ethics, you know, your consulting ethics. So you work with several clients, you work with several companies. Um, you have to understand from your client, uh, number one, whether you are allowed to use their name in any of the examples or any of the data points and all that. And when it comes to data, it becomes even more severe, even more important. So it is very important that you have to have written uh, permission, in my personal view, from your client before you decide to share their data. Uh, unless I would say if the data is public data. So for example, if you're trying to quote the example of a client, and as an example, you want to share the data from their annual report, which is published and is available on internet. I mean, there's no problem with that because that data falls in the public domain. But the challenge for consultants is that sometimes they sign NDA, the non-disclosure agreement with their clients. So when they sign the NDA, they are not supposed to take uh, any information out of the NDA. Now, sometimes they do not sign NDA, and that's where I think a very important ethical decision comes for the consultant, whether they should be sharing that data or information or not, uh, using the name of the client or without using the name of the client. So, you know, at, there, was, there are situations where actually people uh, sometimes, you know, ask for some information and data because they know that I have worked on some of the projects which are known to people for some reason because they were you know, information traveled to the open market. But I just tell them that, look, you know, the data is uh, it's, it's client's property and uh, one of the things that earn you a lot of respect as a consultant is that customers believe that you will not go out and say wrong things about them. So they would trust your judgment, your you know, mental balance and some of those elements. And that is very, very important. But yeah, I mean, understand one thing that that knowledge stays in your mind. And when you are making decisions, when you're making choices for uh, different people, uh, of course that knowledge comes into play when it comes to you doing something for those people. So for example, if you're working in, let's say chemical industry, and you have worked with one client and there's another client from, you understand their challenges could be similar, right? So you can utilize some of the experience to improve the second client's performance. But showing data without consent, I consider it, uh, it's probably not the right thing to do, unless you have written approval from your client. Okay, next question. Is there any platform to get access to the knowledge and success stories of consultants, consultants like you, Azim, where young consultants can gain more insight about solutions proposed by the consultant? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I also look for that all the time. Um, but you know, I don't very frequently see it from, uh, from the consultants. Um, but what I do, I, uh, first of all, I just shared a couple of stories with you, uh, challenges and some of the things. Um, I, I write about my experiences on LinkedIn um, and I go to some of those consultant firms uh, to their websites who actually produce documentation on a very regular basis on a mass scale. 
And I'm talking about the very large consulting firms, right? So many times they, if you read their articles, if you read their case studies, they write about their experiences all the time. Of course, they never quote the name of the clients unless they have the approval to take the name of the client. So um, you can go and read on the websites of large consulting firms. There will be plenty of articles uh, which you can read and understand the trends and you can really uh, learn a lot on those websites. Uh, especially there are reports at times. Uh, but the problem is that there's tremendous amount of information, data and best practices available. It's a 150 page report with charts and data and, and data points and numbers. Uh, people just don't want to read that. If you read that, you will be surprised and amazed at how much information is out there. And uh, I mean, we can just keep learning for the rest of our lives and the information will not finish. And Zim, if I uh, can, I'm just going to add a little bit to that. The 50,000 yeah, sure. foot platform is designed so that you can create a network, uh, no matter if you're a young consultant, a growing consultant, experienced or retired, it is a forum in which you can connect with different consultants and, and speak to them about their experience overall. So um, just making that aware to the community uh, that it is a good place to go uh, and meet uh, clients like a sim uh, and learn more about uh, consulting in general, no matter what uh, level of consultant you're at. We are uh, through the question period. Uh, there's no more questions in the chat room. Uh, so again, I'd like to just thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. For everybody on the line who may have come in a little bit late, um, we have recorded this session. It will be posted in many different locations and we will share it out. On the share, we will have a destination where you can ask further questions um, and uh, we will be able to get uh, questions and answers uh, returned to you. Um, and so please look for that link and we'll be sharing out uh, this video uh, moving forward. Any last words, Sam, before we uh, close out the session? No, I just wanted to thank you, um, uh, 50,000 Foot and uh, Skill Ranch, for having me. It was really fun. Um, and I hope uh, people would find it beneficial. Uh, and if they would go back with one takeaway, I think uh, that's, that's going to be fantastic. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice. Uh, morning, evening, or afternoon. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much.